War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. Welcome to the party, my friends, of Ingstock. And welcome to my channel. This is All Minus One. My name is Bill. Please like, share, and subscribe if you enjoy this kind of content. If you want to watch a live show, a more loose show, a show with a little comedy, I have one every Wednesday over on DLive at 7 p.m. Eastern called The Ends Justify the Memes. You can find us at Ends Justify Memes on DLive. We go live every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern. If you miss that, if you can't watch live, go over to YouTube to The Ends Justify the Memes. This is a uh, replays of everything we do live. Also, if you want to contribute to my welfare, my family's welfare, and my ability to make these videos on a regular basis, consider going over to, to uh, Subscribestar uh, for $4.99 a month. You can subscribe. I have no special content there. But if you, uh, you out there watching start subscribing, I will make specific content just for you and perhaps add some tiers. So let's get into today's subject, and that would be the importance of language, how the progressives use that language, the globalists, the communists, the fascists, and the socialists use that language to manipulate you, and how there are so much gaslighting out there within the media and through politicians. We're also going to talk about some of the uh, ideas behind political correctness. So first, let us play this quick video. I just don't even know why there aren't uprisings all over the country, and maybe there will be. People need to start taking to the streets. This is a dictator. You know, there needs to be unrest in the streets for as long as there is unrest in our lives. Enemies of the state. Show me where it says that protests are supposed to be polite and peaceful. Do something about your dad's immigration practices, you feckless. When they go low, we kick. How do you resist the temptation to run up and wring her neck? The biggest terror threat in this country is white men, most of them radicalized right up to the right. I thought he should have punched him in the face. I said, even if you lost, he insulted your wife. Yes. He came down the escalator and called Mexicans rapists and murders. He said, well, what do you think I should have done? I said, I think you should have punched him in the face and then gotten out of the race. Mm -hmm. You would have been a hero. I'd like to punch him in the face. I said, if we were in high school, I'd take him behind the gym and beat the hell out of him. Punch some people in the face! When was the last time an actor assassinated a president? They're still going to have to go out and put a bullet in Donald Trump, and that's a fact. Look as his character is stabbed to death. Where is John Wilkes Booth when you need him? I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. A Missouri state senator is under investigation by the Secret Service after saying she hopes President Trump is assassinated. I will go and take Trump out tonight. And if you see anybody from that cabinet in a restaurant, in a department store, at a gasoline station, you get out and you create a crowd. And you push back on them. And you tell them they're not welcome. Anymore, anywhere. And sadly, the domestic enemies to our voting system and wow. our honoring our Constitution uh, are right at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. They're not going to stop before Election Day in November, and they're not going to stop after Election Day. And that should be, everyone should take note of that on both levels, that this isn't, they're not going to let up, and they should not. If you think we're rallying now, you ain't seen nothing yet. Make no mistake, we are in an ideological war, a cold war, if you would, that is now breaking out in truly violent and lethal skirmishes. Now, these skirmishes have broke out before in the past, mostly between members of Antifa, some BLM members in the past, and some very few patriotic Americans who have gone out to resist them. There may have been some people that would consider themselves white nationalists or white supremacists involved in much of that. But the reality is, 
is that that is a very small sect of people. And those people, much like Richard Spencer, have now endorsed people like Joe Biden. And the reason why is, is because they are socialist and they always have been. They are not right wingers. They are not people who are of the liberty mindset, the constitutionalist, minarchist, live and let live mindset. And I say now that we quit using their language and start ta stop talking about things as left and right because we have allowed these, these crazy progressives for so long to hold the narrative. They hold all of the power, all of the institutional power. And I'm going to show you some things today which they try to break that narrative in a, in a form, in a way in which they gaslight you. Now, all of that were Democrats asking for people to go out in the street and to rampage and be violent. Like they say that the president's rhetoric is violent and horrible, yet it is not. He is quite the moderate, actually, very much like Bill Clinton. I've said it once and I'll say it again. He has the, the policies of Bill Clinton with the attitude of Teddy Roosevelt. He's probably not anywhere as tough as Teddy Roosevelt, though. So let's go to this. Again, with hundreds of cars filled with supporters of the president rallying in Clackamas County and then driving through downtown Portland. They were supported and energized by the president himself. President Trump, for four years, we've had to live with you and your racist attacks on black people. We learned early about your sexist attitudes towards women. We've had to endure clips of you mocking a disabled man. We've had to listen to your anti-democratic attacks on journalists. We've read your tweets slamming private citizens to the point of receiving death threats. And we've listened to your attacks on immigrants. We've listened to you label Mexicans rapists. We've heard you say that John McCain wasn't a hero because he was a prisoner of war. And now you're attacking Democratic mayors and the very institutions of democracy that have served this nation well since its founding. Do you seriously wonder, Mr. President, why this is the first time in decades that America has seen this level of violence? Now, I'm going to stop it there because there is no more reason to listen to this absolute psychopath, Ted Wheeler. Ted Wheeler has just espoused so many lies there. There are a few truths within that. President Trump did not make fun of a disabled person, or at least that he was aware that they were disabled. The hand motion that he used for that, you can go back and watch this, was something that he used often. Brandon Strzok of the Walk Away movement saw this initially, and it was one of the first things that began to wake him up out of the political gaslighting. President Trump has brought along many people who are black Americans into the Republican Party. Now, the Republicans that have been against President Trump, most of them are CIA deep state type operatives. You can go down the list and look up who they are. These are people who like the institution of power that is against our American Constitution. When you see people like Nancy Pelosi talk about the Constitution, she is lying through her teeth because she could care less. If she would, she would take every single gun out of every single American's hand. And the reason why she would do that is because she knows that she would have more authority and power. I think one of the reasons why she has never run for president is because she understands that her position within the Congress is one of uh, tons and absolute power, more power than anyone should have. She is quite rich, yet nobody talks about Nancy Pelosi making money and her little side deals and doing whatever. Now, I'm not saying Republicans aren't guilty of doing the same thing. They are. The neocons are horrible, and I condemn them wholeheartedly. But that does not represent the majority of Americans who identify as Republicans. And before we get too far off into the weeds, I want to clarify, I am and have been an independent for 15 years. I haven't voted for a president in three elections. So with that, let's move on. So... Marches to Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler's home declared riot Monday as burning debris thrown into building. Key takeaways. This is from 
Oregon Live or the Oregonian. Now, what happened here was people stormed his apartment complex and started lighting it on fire. And there were some few hundred people that live inside that building. So the Portland police to legal observers and members of the press, the police bureau is aware and will adhere to the temporary restraining order regarding legal observers and members of the press uh, present at demonstrations. So this is essentially keeping them away for their own safety. The point I bring up of this is that no matter how much Ted Wheeler wants to shine light otherwise toward the president being the cause of all this or other Democrats, they are going after his home. This is what I was trying to find here was all the pictures. So we can see a burning benches. There were fireworks thrown off. Obviously there were police. Here are some shots of the inside people outside telling him to resign, which I think would uh, behoove the mayor that or he could take in the president's offer. Here are some people that were detained, probably released later. And so you get the point. Go look this up. Uh, Tim Pool did a very good segment on this today. But go look it up. Go look it up for yourself. Do, do not take my word for anything. Here is uh, some fool from Facebook. I get a little confused when Trump says, we will have riots in these streets and lawlessness unless he's reelected. Aren't we already having riotous, or sorry, riots and lawlessness after almost four years of him as president? Doesn't everyone know the little saying about the definition of insanity? Is it something that we're doing wrong? The same thing over and over again, expecting different results or something like that, wondering if America has gone insane if they believe him? Well, what this fool is not taking into account is that under Obama, there were riots in the streets with BLM. There was Antifa in the streets attacking American citizens, and there was little done about it. It got to a point where eventually Ferguson had uh, had brought in the National Guard. I don't believe in Baltimore it was so. And yet the media again wanted to point to the Republicans as if it was their fault. And again, I'm not telling you to go vote for Republicans. I am an independent but I certainly would not vote for any single Democrat at this time. I think if you are going to vote for somebody, you should do a lot of research and you shouldn't be voting if you do not research who you are voting for. And shame on you if you vote across party lines. I do not agree with partisan party politics. I take a stance that George Washington took or took within his farewell address. And that is that party politics and political factions will destroy this nation as they very well have been over the last hundred years. So then this other person replying says, saw it on the internet, internet, so it must be true. Still looking for those Republican run cities being torched by rioters. And then this guy starts, I'm a Democrat and I was extremely educated, retired officer, served mostly, most of his adult life and blah, blah, blah. And he starts talking about whatever. So I don't really know this guy, but, uh, you know, sort of an acquaintance and whatever. And that's always what he does. I'm an elitist. I have a certain pedigree. I know better. You don't understand. I got into an argument with him once about the uh, Michigan protesters and he was talking about how the the uh, three percenters there were terrorists and whatever else. Yet this guy isn't intelligent enough to point out the left wing violence or the progressive violence on the streets being propped up by the Democrats. So from Psychology Today, 11 warning signs of gaslighting. Now, maybe I can't do dark mode on this. Let's see here. So I'm not going to get into all of the uh, the aspects of gaslighting. You should know what that is. It's essentially people that that say one thing and then try to make you crazy by saying, well, I didn't say that a minute later or a day later or whatever it was. That is essentially gaslighting. They do little things to trick and fool you to manipulate your mind. They tell blatant lies. You know it's an outright lie, yet they are telling you with this lie with a straight face. They deny they ever said something, even though you have proof. 
They use what is near and dear to you as ammunition. They know how important your kids are to you and they know how important your identity is to you. This is a, this was very prevalent with my first wife who, uh, has a, uh, a cluster B personality disorder known as borderline personality disorder. And she would do these kind of things to me. We would get in a fight. I would leave the house to cool off. And then she would incessantly call me and, and I would tell her to let me be so I could cool down. And, and she would say, well, what if I need to call you about the children? What if something happened to the children? That is part of gaslighting. They wear you down over time. That ex that's exactly what happens. They demoralize you as Yuri Bezmanov talks about. Their actions do not match their words. This is key because anyone who has integrity will stand up to how they, they act, how they live. Their words will not be empty or false. Now, I'm not saying the president is perfectly integrous at all. I just know that the president right now is a better pick than the globalist progressives that don't care about you, that have been in office and been in power for years. The last time we had a good autonomous president was Ronald Reagan. They tried to assassinate him. And before that was probably JFK, a Democrat, mind you, and they did assassinate him. They throw in a positive reinforcement to confuse you. They know confusion weakens people. Gaslighters know that people like having a sense of stability or normalcy. Their goal is to uproot this and to make you constantly question everything. A human's nature, or sorry, a human's natural tendency is to look to the person or entity that will help you feel more stable, and that's what happens to be the or that happens to be the gaslighter. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that happens, of course, in personal relationships. But it also happens when you look to politicians being your leaders. And it's what happens when you look to other professionals to be your experts instead of thinking for yourself. And I get it. You have to do that to the level that you're capable of doing that or the time that you potentially have to do that. But I tell you right now, you need to look deeper into things or you need to find people who will and do who aggregate that for you and look at a variety of sources do not ever take my word for this alone. Go look it up yourself. They project huge, huge. I talk about this all the time. They are drug users or a cheater, yet they are constantly accusing you of that. This is done so often that you start trying to defend yourself and are distracted from the gaslighter's own behavior. My ex-wife was an adulteress. She would accuse me of adultery. I was faithful to her the entire time that we were together. The Democrats, the progressives, project all and everything about themselves onto them. It is part of the rules for radicals. I will cover that probably later on this week, as well as some other projects that I have in mind. In any case, it is part of their strategy they have a two-pronged strategy, essentially, when you break it down. One, project everything evil and bad that they do onto their opposition. Two, emotionally grab people and do not make any logical arguments. It's like I said, Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer or whomever else talk about the Constitution and eroding the Constitution. Yeah, they don't care about that. They haven't listened to it in some odd time. Uh, most neocons don't listen to it either. But the reality is, is that they are simply projecting what they are doing. And uh, if they they did listen to the Constitution, they wouldn't be putting people into the Supreme Court like Sotomayor or Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Not because they're women, but because they don't care about the Constitution and its original intent. They try to align people against you. Well, that mob mentality. And they will do that. They will manipulate people and... Right here it says, our master uh, manipulating and finding the people they know who will stand by them no matter what. That is called collectivism. It is a horrible thing. It makes you a non-person, a non-entity. They tell you or others that you are crazy. They sure do. You can't trust your own eyes and your own ears. They tell you everyone else is a liar. 
everyone but them. This happens a lot. It says, by telling you that everyone else, your family, the media is a liar, they're making you question your reality. Now, the Democrats accuse the, the president of doing this. The progressives accuse the president of doing this, except for the media is the gaslighters. They gaslight constantly. Uh, right wing media per se does not as much. They tend to be a little bit more objective, but even the fact checking, checking sites, uh, gaslight people by, by switching little tiny things to make factual statements, non-facts. Um, it, it, it's crazy what they do. And most people fall for it because they don't either have the intelligence or the time. So you can go read that for yourself. That was, uh, that was 11 things that gaslighters do, something like that. <laughs> Let me get up here to the top real quick. 11 warning signs of gaslighting. So you can claim the president does this. You could claim this. I'm not saying he's, he's always completely truthful, but I think mostly he speaks off the cuff and he's just being hyperbolic. No, a lot of people are hyperbolic on both sides of the aisle or any side of the aisle that you may consider yourself on. Being hyperbolic is not quite the same thing, though, as purely gaslighting. I am hyperbolic in some cases. I try not to be, but uh, I'm passionate about what I'm talking about. And there's a reason for that, because our country is in some serious, serious danger. And you may not believe that. And maybe that is complete hyperbole on my part. I don't think it is. I think that the Democrats are using those useful idiots out in the streets who are criminal elements and terroristic to sway those who would think that they would bring law and order. And yet they probably will not. And if anything, the, what they have done is wreck their economies in the states that they run and the cities that they run and allowed these riots, these insurrections to continue. Now I understand that they are not citywide in all these areas, but it doesn't matter. They keep happening. We just saw Senator Rand Paul, as well as Dan Bongino and uh, Brandon Strzok, uh, and, or Strzok, sorry, and uh, Mikey Harlow all get assaulted walking out of the DNC, or sorry, the RNC. Excuse me. Those people were walking out of the RNC in DC, I could tell you, because I've been there many a times, is normally a very safe place to walk, except for a certain area within DC. But downtown DC, around the Capitol buildings and the White House, there are usually a ton of police. It's very safe. There's not a lot of crime. It, there's a huge business district there. Lots of restaurants, lots of cool stuff to do. And lots of tourism. It's a very safe area. Not anymore. Not anymore. Because these people have been activated. And I warned about escalating, escalating violence from people who are not of this political disposition. People who are all of the liberty mindset. That is what has happened. That is what happened when the supposed Trump supporter, that Patriot Prayer person, was executed in the street the other day. Not the same thing as the young man in Kenosha. Not the same thing at all. He was self-defense. That was a murder that happened in Portland. It was outright murder. And it's not the first time. We've seen it in the Chaz, but how, how short is your memory, America? How delusional do you have to be? So this is from the Orwell Foundation. This is politics and the English language. Let's see. It says, now it is clear that the decline of language must ultimately have political and economic causes. It is not due simply to the bad influence of this or that individual writer, but the effect can become a cause reinforcing the original cause and producing the same effect in an intensified form and so on indefinitely. A man may take to drink because he feels himself to be a failure and then fails all the more completely because he drinks. It is rather the same thing that is happening to the English language. It becomes ugly and inaccurate because our thoughts are foolish. But the solvency of our language makes it easier for us to have foolish thoughts. 
The point is that the process is reversible. Modern English, especially written English, is full of bad habits, habits which spread by intimidation and which can be avoided if one is willing to take the necessary trouble. If one gets rid of these habits, one can think more clearly. And to think clearly is to uh, necessary for, is, is a necessary first step towards regeneration so that the fight against bad English is not frivolous and not the ex uh, exclusive concern of professional writers. I will come back to this presently, and I hope that by the time uh, the meaning of what I have said here can and have become clear. Meanwhile, here are some specimens of English language as it is now habitually written. And so he goes on to the degeneration of the English language. Now he's talking about from an academic type standpoint, but this was something that Orwell was quite interested in. And I will stress that Orwell was um, very much on the side of communism, but he didn't like authoritarian communism. He didn't understand because he, he took that emotional appeal. Well, my emotional appeal to you is, is how about I let you be free? The idea, do not tread on me and I will not tread on you. I may have my beliefs, but I do not need to put them onto you. I want you to be free to go live your life as you wish, as long as you do not assault me. Now, if you assault me, we might have a problem. And Lord willing, I will have the strength not to assault you back. But I can tell you that many people do not have a faith that I have. So here from a communist pamphlet, if a new spirit is to be infused into this old country, there is one thorny and contentious reform which must be tackled. And that is the humanization and galvanization of the BBC. Timidity here will bespeak cranker and atrophy of the soul. The heart of Britain may be sound and of strong beat, for instance, but the British lion's roar at present is like that of the bottom of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, as gentle as any suckling dove. A virile New Britain cannot continue indefinitely to be transduced in the eyes, or rather ears, of the world by the effant, uh, languors of Langham Palace. There's some alliteration there that I can't get past. Brazenly masquerading as standard English. When the voices of Britain is heard at nine o'clock, better far and infinitely less uh, ludicrous to hear. <laughs> the attaches honestly drop. Anyways, you get that that is overly verbose, purposefully to sound intellectual. Stephen Pinker actually gives a rather good lecture about this instead of speaking plainly. It says each of these passages has faults of its own, but quite apart from... Uh, avoidable ugliness. Two qualities are common from them all. The first is st staleness of imagery. The other is a lack of precision. So I bring all this up because again, he is talking specifically about the languages degrading over time in English. He's talking about English speakers because Orwell to some degree was a snob, but he tried hard not to be. So he had this interesting perspective, which led him to read 1984. So here, real quick from ResearchGate, language as an oppressive device in Orwell's 1984. Let's see. This paper is a critical study of 1984, a novel by George Orwell. It specifically aims to study how language is used by the dominant authority in the fiction as opposed to... Um, and exert power over the population in the country. The analysis focuses on how the totalitarian system limits conversations and prevents freedom of speech through imposing on the characters to speak a language which is strange to them and very limited in terms of vocabulary. To achieve this objective, the study will focus on the sentences and paragraphs which show how language is used to frighten and oppress people. In certain cases, the dialogues which occur between the characters will be explored so as to clearly manifest the role of language in controlling the actions and the minds of the population. To manifest the relationship between language and power, 
The analysis is conducted within the framework of stylistic and critical discourse analysis. The researchers explore the linguistic features in some paragraphs and dialogues selected from the entire text, as so to show the government of Oceana controls the minds and the actions of its inhabitants through such frameworks of analysis. The thesis concludes that the totalitarian government manipulates language to dominate people. And language is not a social practice, but it has political dimensions and regarded as a threat to the government if people use it freely. Aha! So, <laughs> going back to this little paper here of Orwell's about how language is being corrupted, overly verbose, or on the other hand, weakened. Weakened as in... Y'all, you know what's going on here? That kind of stuff. The uh, hick talk, the redneck talk. Don't disparage those people. Common parlance is just fine. Understand, though, how it is used sometimes to manipulate people. So here there's a bunch of quotes. This is a really good study to read. But for the sake of time, I'm not going to uh, go over all of this. Again, this is language as an oppressive device in Orwell's 1984. So that brings me to this, cognitive behavioral therapy. This is from the APA, the American Psychological Association. Now, I think the APA has its problems because it's politicized. However, this is a uh, very... Uh, very good work in, in, in clinical study. This is a clinical practice guide to the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder is with cognitive behavioral therapy. A lot of people who have borderline personality disorder, that cluster B personality, can actually be um, uh, largely, I wouldn't say cured, but uh, largely controlled. They can control a lot of their emotions and irrational behaviors by using cognitive behavioral therapy. This is in the literature. And the reason why I bring this up is because it is clinically known that a lot of people think a certain way and by working through their own self-talk, much as Orwell talks in Newspeak or Doublethink, that they can then create their own realities. And my grander point of all of this has to do with how the media and the politicians manipulate the way that you think. They gaslight you, in other words. So let's read here real quick. Based on several core principles, psychological problems are based in part on faulty or unhelpful ways of thinking. This is why people have things like Trump derangement syndrome. Now, you could say I have something like Biden derangement syndrome or anything else. Um, that's just not true. I, uh, you know, I'm not, I think Biden's whatever. I think uh, Kamala Harris is, is whatever. I don't think they're good for the nation in any way because I want to see the nation go back towards constitutionalism. Um, I think that that will create a strong America. I think stopping, uh, Americans, I shouldn't say stopping, but let's say keeping Americans from a line on institutions as it has become versus the way it used to be where Americans were independent is, is uh, a much better way to construct a strong society. Strong individuals who rely too much on institutional power will always eventually become weak individuals. And those weak individuals would then become slaves to tyranny. And that is what I do not want for anybody. Tyranny is immoral. Psychological problems are uh, based in part on learning patterns of unhelpful behavior. People suffering from psychological problems can learn better ways of coping with them, thereby relieving their symptoms and becoming more effective in their lives. And this is what's, what is happening with the people that are walking away. People like Carlin uh, uh, Borisinko, who is a psychologist herself, uh, although she studies a different field, um, came away from this. She does not do clinical psychology. Uh, she, she does uh, 
oh, I don't recall what it is, but she basically does team building and working within um, uh, businesses, leadership type stuff. So treatment usually involves the changing thinking patterns learning to recognize one's distortions and thinking that are, that create problems and then to reevaluate them in the light of reality. See that creates, or sorry, that, that, uh, that necessitates thinking, not emoting. That's not pathos people, not following your passions, not emoting, but logos, logic, reason. And so many out there are just under that, that pathos, that, that emotional outrage, gaining a better understanding of behavior and motives of others. Very important because if you always demonize the other, you will always be an emotional wreck. Problem solving skills to cope with difficult situations. By the way, speaking of demonizing, this is why I always say we need to have compassion for those who do not hold our beliefs you need to understand that they are foolish, mostly willfully ignorant and misled. Those are people that need our sympathy. Learning to develop a greater sense of confidence in one's own ability. Aha! Getting away from elitism. Getting away from the professionals, the experts, the leaders, and understanding you are a capable person. See, when Trump talks about making America great again, and he talks about American nationalism and bringing jobs back to America and all those things, all those raw, raw points, like those aren't my favorite points of his, but what he is saying is that America doesn't need the global world to get by. And I agree. And it makes us weak to outsource ourselves to the world. We need to be independent people. So treatments also involve efforts to change behavioral patterns, facing one's own fears instead of avoiding them. That's huge. People avoid, people avoid the truth and their fear all of the time. And it's usually because they're afraid of the truth. The lie is much more comfortable to live with. Role-playing to prepare for potential problematic interactions with others. Learning to calm one's mind and relax the body. So again, this is from the um, APA. So this is from ideas.ted.com, how language can affect the way we think. Now, this is a little bit different. This is more about uh, linguistics as far as different languages from around the world. Um, talks about uh, Kenneth Chen, uh, might be an economist, but he wants to talk about the language. For instance, he points out the Chinese saying is, this is my uncle, is not as straightforward as you might think. In Chinese, you have no choice but to encode more information about said uncle. The language requires you to denote the side the uncle is on, whether he, he's related by marriage or birth, and if your father's brother or whatever else. It says, all this information is oblig obligatory. Chinese does not let me be ignorant of it, says Chen. In fact, if I want to speak correctly, Chinese forces me to constantly think about it. You know, this may be a difference in in uh, IQs as far as Asians go. They, on average, developed Asian nations have a 10-point IQ lead on um, Western nations, European nations. So if your language is more complex, and again, it goes back to that Orwellian thing. If we are too simplified, we simplify and we dumb everything down to the lowest common denominator much like in 1984, then we're susceptible to manipulation. If we are overly verbose and overly intelligent, then we, we push those people out. I feel like often that the, the progressives, they wish to not push those people out, but pull them in through simplistic language and emotional trauma, literally, by the way they project these things onto them and onto their, their opposition. They do this in order to gain votes. They take advantage of it. It's one of the reasons why for a long time, the Republicans have had a, um, this air of, uh, that these are the rich elite people. I've heard so many people tell me this yet. Most people, if you live in a rural area, 
similar to where I do. Now I, I'm actually more in suburbia and it, it's, it's, it is actually urban. It's just not ultra urban, but it's out in uh, the countryside, if you would. Mm. But um, if you live in those less populated areas, you'll find that they are more conservative. And it's not because people are, are uh, stupid as the elitist in cities would believe. It's because they have traditional American values and people and who are elitists who live in the big cities do not. They don't identify with traditional American values. They identify with elitist progressive values as all elitist progressives do, as all fascist, socialist, and communists do. They know better than you. See, the, the liberty live and let live minarchist constitutionalist perspective says, I do not know better than you. That's, be, that's why we are anti-tyrannical. So he continues with this. I thought about covering a couple articles about this, but it is interesting. This is a very short uh, article. Of course, he talks about gender and Finnish and Hebrew and some differences. All Most languages have uh, gendered languages or sorry, gendered aspect to their language. Color, this is an important thing they talk about. Um, I've read about Japanese, the difference between green and blue, there really is no difference. Um, yellow and orange in some languages. Here it says, blame the English speakers. In the same article, uh, Brododitsky notes that in English, we often say that someone broke a, a vase, even if it was an accident. But Spanish and Japanese speakers tend to say that the vase broke itself. Interesting. So they don't lay, lay blame on anyone because it broke itself. We just clarify that it was an accident. He describes a study by her students, uh, or she, I guess, describes a study by her students in which English speakers were much more likely to remember who accidentally popped balloons, broke eggs, or spilled drinks in a video than Spanish or Japanese speakers. Well, that's how language, again, ref, uh, influences how we think about the world. Those people in Spanish or, or Japanese and their studies are sitting there saying, well, there's really no guilt there. Let's not assign it. In English, we assign guilt. There's a lot of jurisprudence in our language. In fact, most of our language, most of our language, sorry, guys, if I'm a little tongue tied today, happens on uh, occasion. But most of our language is based off of jurisprudence. It's based out of the Bible and then Shakespeare and then things like uh, 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 Black's Law Commentaries, Blackwell's uh, Commentaries, and, and those things as English was being created. Why? Because we were developing this system of liberty within the Western world, unlike anywhere else. And that fully came to fruition within America. Although forces of darkness and evil, and this is not hyperbolic, these people are malicious and evil. Look at what they do. You cannot tell me there is no objective reality to this. There is. They are either hurting people or they are not. And they are most certainly hurting people. And it is not with their words. It is through direct action, people. Direct action and violence. So again, from Kenneth, MD, the language you speak affects your behavior. Research shows. We've known for thousands of years that we become what we repeatedly think. I am reminded of the ancient proverb, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So we can go through this. I'm going to uh, skip this for the sake of time. I did have another article uh, counteracting th this kind of narrative because this is debated within psychology the social sciences to some degree, which is just silly. This debate has to do with trying to get rid of racism. It has to do with ideology. It has nothing to do with the, the actual fact that different languages make you think differently. Now, I don't know many languages. I used to speak German okay, like like basic German. Um, I used to, I, I studied Latin for two years in, in school and was not very good at it. And I, I study uh, a little bit of Greek now, and I'm not, I'm a poor student, you know, cause I, I, I just am too interested in other things, but I can tell you that the way that they thought and the words that we got from that were, were slightly different, but those, the connotations, 
The emotional aspects of what those words mean are important to those ancient languages in which we now derive. And the reason why I study those three languages specifically is because what th that is what English is based out of. Now, English is mostly Germanic and, and French Latin, um, but that French, of course, goes way back to the ancient Latin. And how people thought in ancient times, again, directly affects us today. They talk about the heart being the seat of emotions. We still speak that way today. That's a 2000 plus year old tradition that comes through in English now because we share a common linguistic past. So this is interesting. I want to get into mob mentality real quick. This is from a middle school. I love it. I love it. So the psychology of mob mentality and violence. One dog may bark at you, but it is more likely that a pack will attack you. We are not exempt from that behavior because we as humans are, are not canine or sorry, and not canine. That doesn't make any sense. But anyways, as evidenced by dogs operating in a pack environment, human society is based on group dynamics. This is where I get into the idea that we are both a collective and individuals. I think the individualistic portion needs to be far more developed. You develop the collective nature by being in direct relationship with people, not by affiliating with some party or some leadership or some ideology that really has nothing to do with your life. Anyways, let's keep reading. What we might not do as individuals, we may do as part of a group. People may lose control of their usual inhibitions as their mentality becomes that of the group. Carl Jung talked about this, about people who weren't developed or individuated being susceptible to this. And this is how tyranny comes about. What are we seeing now? Have you ever heard of a peaceful riot? Riots, by definition, are violent in nature. That's really interesting because I've heard of a lot of riots of peace lately. All a riot is, is a violent group behavior. The larger the group, the greater the amplification of that group. If the group behavior is peaceful, exemplified by Martin Luther King and Gandhi, the group behavior behavior is peaceful and orderly. Funny, I read a subreddit the other day um, that, that just was absolutely insane. I know Reddit is mostly left wing, but it was on a Jordan Peterson subreddit, which is even more interesting. And these people are, were saying that, that Martin Luther King would approve of BLM. And I am telling you now that he would not. And they started saying, well, he was a communist. He was a socialist. No, I, I don't think he was. He believed in some socialistic uh, reparations, perhaps, to get black America caught up. I think more or less, I'm not an expert on Dr. King, but I think more or less that's what he was talking about. He was actually rather conservative and he did believe in nonviolence. And I do believe that he would condemn BLM because he was not necessarily a fan of the Black Panthers. But he wasn't also a fan of people like Malcolm X because Malcolm X was a segregationist. He didn't believe necessarily in government segregation, but he believed that black people should leave uh, whites alone and be on their own. So there are shades of gray there. But the one thing that the most important thing is, is he stood up and said, we cannot be violent. And that's why he was effective. If group behavior is violent, the larger the group, the more magnified the violence. The mob mentality phenomenon has occurred throughout human history. Think of the French Revolution people. Whether witch burnings, religious zealotry, political protest, uh, or reaction to perceived racial microaggressions. Yeah, have you ever seen a group of uh, racial minorities randomly beat up somebody, whether it be someone of their own group or someone of their out group, namely usually white people. Three psychological theories address crowd behavior. First is cognition theory proposes that crowds exert a hypnotic influence on their members that result in irrational and emotionally charged behavior often referred to as crowd frenzy. I think it, that's part of it. Of course, 
Theories do not have to be um, separate. No, the scientists like to separate everything. But more than one thing can be true at once. Second is convergence theory. That argues that behavior of a crowd is not an emergent property of the crowd, but is a result of like-minded individuals coming together. This is also true. If it becomes violent, it is not because the crowd encouraged violence, yet rather people want to be violent and came together in a crowd. The third is emergent norm theory, and that combines the two above. Okay. And it says individuals, anonymity, and shared emotions lead to crowd behavior. And that is often true. The anonymity allows you to be violent. It allows you to get away with it. Here's another thing. I actually meant to bring this up today, but go look at Viva Fry and and uh, Robert Barnes' conversation of um, the Kenosha shooting and Barnes' assessment of it. And toward the end, about 40 minutes, 45 minutes in or so, he talks about how the... Um, how he studied the the behavior of racist of the past, the KKK and other groups uh, as a such. And what he found is that often it attracts psychopathy, people who are already troublemakers and whatever, because of the political atmosphere permitting it. And that's important because what politics really means is the polis, the city state. It means of the people, it means the people. The, the structure of the people and how we protect them. This is the only true legitimate purpose of government is protecting the people and their liberties. It's not to give you free stuff. It is not to put the spoon in your mouth. It is not to wipe your butt like your mommy, like you're a little kid. That's not what it's for. It's to keep you safe from violent and evil people if you are not able to do so yourself. It is to keep you safe from people who would take advantage of you. It is to keep you safe from people who would steal from you. It is to keep you safe from people who would uh, loot and murder you. I'll give you another example of how psychopaths were basically weaponized during the Civil War. Mo most people, because the South is so demonized about the Civil War, regardless of their stance of slavery or not, not everyone in the South owned slaves or thought slavery was a good thing. But regardless of that, it was their homeland. In the North, the Northern armies and Lincoln sanctioned people to go down in militias as raiders, and they burned down lands and raped and pillaged people. If you have ever seen the movie, the Clint Eastwood movie, The Outlaw of Josie Wales, it shows you that specifically. This happened, people, and it is something we do not talk about in history because, well, we have to erase that history. We have to erase the balanced notion of the North being evil aggressors as much as the South was evil slavers. See, two people, two things can be true at the same time. So here, this is from Medium says American has always embraced the herd mentality. This is not true, but it does happen. The American founding was based on individuality, individualization. If something like only 10% of the people were involved in the revolutionary war. That was not herd mentality. And the elitists, the people that thought that they could do such a thing, wanted to allow the people to be free. In fact, the reason why we have the current constitution that we always ignore is because of Shay's Rebellion, a mob that turned into a riot and insurrection. It says, with growing dominance of social media, is the herd mentality going to become a permanent fixture in our daily lives? The herd mentality has always been prevalent in times perceived social media crisis in America. The Oxford English Dictionary describes herd mentality as the tendency for people's behavior and beliefs to conform to those of a group to which they belong. I do not belong to any group. I only, the only group I belong to as being, is being an American patriot who wants to live freely and wants every single one of you to reach your fullest potential by living freely, by manifesting your best self. 
The recent frenzy regarding the removal of Confederate monuments in the most recent example of the herd mentality manifest in America. The Salem witch trials is one of the earliest examples of the herd mentality or mob mentality taking hold here in America. Between 18 uh, 92 and 1693, more than 200 people were accused of being witches and 20 were ultimately executed. The socioeconomic strain of King William's war led to an influx of displaced persons in Salem's, which uh, resulted in quarreling families due to scarcer resources. Resources is always a thing. Scarcity is always a thing. It's why communism doesn't work. It's like the first rule of economics, scarcity. The arguments between the residents of Salem was believed to be the work of the devil. Accusations of witches and witchcraft spread like wildfire through Salem. With the wife of Cotton Mathers, a respected minister in Salem, even being accused of witchcraft. Finally, Mathers' uh, father, who was president of Harvard, stated it were better that 10 suspected witches should escape than one innocent person be condemned. Yes. What we have now in America is a witch trial, a crisis of people being called Nazis by accusers who just hate their opposition. They want to talk about political correctness. Let's get into that very quickly. Here is a... Uh, from Springer Link, political correctness, the twofold protection of liberalism. Here's the abstract. Now, I don't agree with this author, but it is interesting the, the way he, he, he frames this. And I think he does this because he's an academic. As understood today, political correctness aims to prevent social discrimination by curtailing offensive speech and behavior towards underprivileged groups of individuals. The core proponents of political correctness often draw on postmodernist uh, or sorry, postmodernism and critical theory and are notorious for their skepticism about objective truth and scientific rationality, which is why they should be absolutely rejected. If you think the world is not a objective reality, if you do not think that there is a nature to life and human beings, then I am sorry, my friends, you have lost it. You are insane. And, um, you, you need to do a lot of soul searching. He says, conversely, the critics of postmodern political correctness uphold enlightenment, liberal principles of scientific reasoning, rational truth, seeking an open discourse against claims of relativism and oppression. So his point here is that they are two sides of the same coin and the same phenomenon. I do not agree with this. It, to me, is just some crazy academic trying to justify postmodernism, which is what they do constantly. Real quick, though, I do want to read this. Oxford Dictionary of New Words. PC is conformity to a body of liberal or radical opinion on social matters characterized by the advocacy of appro approved views and the rejection of language and behavior considered discriminatory or offensive. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what, though? You have every right to be discriminatory or offensive. And you have no right not to be offended. Now, there might be consequences to that. You might get in a verbal fight. You might get in a physical altercation. I don't know what to tell you. I think you should exercise some self-control and how you speak and how you act. But, you know, I'm one of those uh, radical, liberal, enlightenist type people. <laughs> I find this interesting, though. Radical opinion. The other day on Timcast IRL, his nightly podcast, he was talking about with his uh, co-host and producer, Lydia, how the left always frames the right as radical. The Democrats and the progressives frame the right as radical, yet every position they have is radical. The progressives are the radicals. That's why Saul Alinsky's book is called Rules for Radicals. Here is a study about political correctness. 80% of Americans believe political correctness is a problem. Now, this is from the that, uh, that Hidden Tribe study that I talked about the other day. This is from The Intercept. This, my friends, 
is left progressive gaslighting. Just insanity. Political correctness is destroying America. Just not how you think. <laughs> if you have any indication, this guy's going to say, it's the Republicans. It really isn't. It says, America today faces a terrifying danger. Political correctness. It is an existential threat, not just to American state, but to all human civilization. But this, obviously, I mean right-wing political correctness. Maybe you're surprised to hear this, but in the uh, uh, U.S. media, there is no shortage of lamentation about political correctness and how it chills debate. But they're almost always about the threat of left-wing PC because that's where it's coming from. In reality, political correctness or cancel culture or whatever you want to call it is not a phenomenon of left, right, or center. It's a phenomenon of human nature. Now, that is true. But this is what, what they do. Let me gaslight you. I'm going to bring in a little bit of truth, and then I'm going to tell you a lie. All humanity, infinite tribes, are prone to groupthink and pushing, uh, or sorry, punishing heretics. What is everything I showed you today? That's why the principle of free thought has to be defended. It is, unfortunately, a weird and unnatural fit for humans. It is not. That's where the Enlightenment came in. That is why it is, it is considered one of the highest pinnacles of, of society that we got to. With those Enlightenment values, we actually had uh, this thing called laissez-faire capitalism and minarchism and many nations, and they became incredibly rich and had the fastest growing middle class ever in history until progressivism came in and destroyed that. And they continue to erode away at that a road away at that, and they will make everyone poor with their utopia. They're nowhere. There are absolutely examples of up ugly political correctness from the U.S. left. Whatever that means in a country that, by historical standards, does not have a left. Now, this is funny. We do have a left. It's just that the left is quite different than the European left. Um, I will talk about that. I don't think I got into that yet, but I will talk about that eventually here. There is a older, older article from the New York Times that speaks about this. But the vast, vast majority of political correctness in America is conservative. <laughs> this is news to me. This is real big news to me, especially uh, considering the uh, meme war, which is quite offensive and yet hilarious. Conservative PC is so powerful in the U.S. that much of it is adopted by both political parties and all of the corporate media. This is insanity, right? <laughs> Absolute insanity. Who is making the woke commercials? Who made the Gillette commercial? Remember the woke Gillette commercial? Who made the um, all the commercials about BLM? Nike, you know, all the people that stand behind them. Amazon, Netflix, everyone else. Every corporate organization? I don't think so. Then it says, instead we call it things like patriotism. No, uh, patriotism is a thing where you love your country and the structure of, it's not the land alone. Part of it's the land, but the structure of that country. So if you were a Bolshevik during the Bolshevik revolution and afterwards as they came into power you would be considered a patriot of the time <sighs> mind blown right that's all patriotism is about so it goes full examination he says religion okay foreign policy the american foreign policy people is progressive it is globalist it is run by the um, Council of Foreign Relations. The fact that this guy is even bringing this up and he's saying that this is right wing. No, 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 no. This is neo-lib and, and, and neoconservatives doing this. But this is how they gaslight you. This is how they, they remove blame. And this is how they keep that false dichotomy, that Hegelian dialectic of the two-party system that doesn't really exist in the United States. This is why you have those Republicans coming out right now saying they're for Joe Biden. 
No right-minded Republican would vote for Joe Biden unless they enjoy the deep state global expansion and erosion of American sovereignty. And I mean, not just sovereignty of, of the government. I mean, sovereignty of the very citizens, the people that live within it. Let's keep scrolling. I don't, I, I mean, man, this guy has so much to say about that, right? Just ridiculous. Ooh, the Republican party. They're more strict than the Chinese Communist Party. Okay, I I, I haven't seen the uh, the Uyghur uh, political correctness re-education camps. I haven't seen the Republican Party come out and talk about concentration camps like the Bernie supporters do for all of those the gulags that is for all of those who disagree with their their Bolshevik revolution. Police. I'm going to read this. With millions of people turning out in demonstrations against police brutality, there are some obvious questions we should be asking ourselves. Why are cops acting this way? You know, this was a few years back. This was 2017. So, um, I believe. Let's see. And so much more. Again, I don't want to read all this. This is just how they gaslight you. Oh, oh no, no. This is 2020. I'm sorry. My mistake. It's the Republicans that are the politically, the politically correct people. Absolute insanity. I'm going to read you guys this real quick. This was from a Quillette article. I used this in uh, one of my earlier videos, but it's very important because if you don't know who Milan Kundera is, um, he essentially was a, a Czech. Well, it says right here that was part of the, the Soviet uh, power structure of the Soviet party. He watched the Soviets come in the Czechoslovakia, uh, and take it over. He, he was a party member and he criticized them and then was exiled and lived in France much of his life. And so he wrote several books and was kind of a satirist and whatever. But, um, what he says here is very, very important. So it says the first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory, destroy its books, its culture, its history. Then have somebody write new books, manufacture a new culture, invite a new history. Before long, that nation will begin to forget what it is and what it was. The world around it will forget even faster. And uh, that's really what's going on here. That's what PC is about. This is all communist subversion. That's what all this gaslighting about. That's what all this stuff with the Dems is about. Like, do I need to go back and play this video again for you? Yeah, let's watch it again. I, I, I just don't even know why there aren't uprisings all over the country. And maybe there will be. People need to start taking to the streets. This is a dictator. You know, there needs to be unrest in the streets for as long as there. By the way, if Trump's a dictator, why hasn't he been a dictator? Why hasn't he just come in and just rounded them all up and executed them? No, these Democratic politicians and these prosecutors are letting these people go night after night after night and refusing, refusing federal help. There's unrest in our lives. Enemies of the state. Show me where it says that protests are supposed to be polite and peaceful. In the Constitution where it says peaceful protest. I was going to play for you guys this. Uh, this is George Carlin on political correctness and fascism pretending to be manners. Um, I'm just not going to do it for the sake of time because I'm already going long enough as I usually do. But Carlin did this bit back in the 90s. And it's really important because he talked about this. I, I remember living through this when I was a young teen in the 90s. And it went away. It was defeated. Um, the ideas just didn't hold. But we didn't have an internet like we do now. And that's how much of this has uh, prolif proliferated. So before I end, I do want to show you this. Back to 1984. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. Gaslighting. The boot on the face. Vote Democrat or else. And that's really what is going on here. So with that, thank you all for watching. Um, I hope you get the gist of everything. Understand what's really going on. 
Open your minds, open your eyes. I know so many of you have been awakened. There's so many more that have been activated as well on the progressive side of things. Most of them though are being willfully blind or, or disingenuous. They're not honest people. They're not developed people. Many of them are scumbags, psychopaths, manipulators. And I mean that, and I know that for a fact, because you can you can gauge their who they are by how they talk, by how much they puff themselves up, if they're elitist or not, all that kind of stuff. If they're really in touch with the real world, and most of them are not, or they are uh, the dredges of society, criminals, people who aren't developed, people who want a free handout. And I know those people rather well too. Maybe you don't think that I have psychological insight to things, but I, I, I just, I guarantee you, I, I understand more about human nature than, uh, than most people do in, in, um, not because I'm an expert by any means, but just because of the, the, the things that have come across within my life from being in the military, from being too exposed to a lot, from, from the reading that I do, from having a traumatic uh, relationship with, with a, um, a tyrannical person. So that was very personal to me. Um, from working in a, a correctional environment, from all of these things, and from being a person that tries to be objective as possible and as forgiving as possible of all these people. And um, again, I, I fail at it all the time. I keep striving to be better at it and you should too. So with all that said, people, this has been all minus one. I wish you all well. Uh, if you like this, please like share and subscribe and Hey, come check me out tomorrow night on D live ends justify memes, 7 PM. Take care.